Dear church, let's talk about rethinking missions. Hello, and welcome to the Dear Church Podcast. I'm your host, Chris McCurley, joined by my coworker and new best friend, Chad Garrett. Chad, thanks for coming on, buddy. Glad to be here. To give everybody some insight into who you are. So when I got the job here at Walnut Street, they said, we're not just hiring you, we're going to actually hire three more staff members because they'd done a survey, they put together a committee, and what do we need to go into the future at Walnut Street? And you were one of those positions. So technically, I think it's connections minister. That's Your right. job is to connect our, our folks with each other and then with the community. And by the way, you're doing an excellent job. And um, I'll tell our folks that when you first came to interview for the job, I, I, I didn't know you. We didn't know each other. Right. Um, I had called some folks that you know, I thought would be great to work with. They didn't want to move. And so one of the elders said, hey, what about Chad Garrett? You had done some mission work that our people had gone on and worked with you in the mission field. So you were a known commodity. And uh, when you came and interviewed the first time, you remember what you asked me? You said, what do you want out of this whole deal? And I said, I want a friend. I, I was up here by myself. My wife wasn't here yet. I want a friend. And that has worked well. So Amen. Uh, Chad and I have uh, really hit it off and is love at first sight, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, so Chad comes out of the mission field. You've been in Indian land, South Carolina for three, three years, four years? Yeah, three and a half years. Yeah. So say. a startup church there and did a magnificent job getting it off the ground. We were able to persuade you to come and work with us. Beautiful wife, Amanda, two kids, Mostyn and Cohen, uh, who I especially like because they like soccer. But uh, so uh, tell us anything else that we need to know about you before we jump in. Uh, just introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. So I grew up Presbyterian. Okay. And I went through a wandering phase, if you would call it that, a rebellious phase of trying to figure out things in the world a little bit. Mm -hmm. And in college, I was outreached. Um, with the gospel uh, through a campus ministry. Okay. And my wife, my high school sweetheart, we went to college together. We were starting to do the adulting thing yeah. and our heads, we were trying to get our head space right. And what are we going to do with our life? And we were reached with the gospel. And so uh, early on, I was uh, Tony Wallace uh, baptized a man and I and mentored us. Okay. And same with his wife, Ginger mentored Amanda. And I took an intern in campus ministry from there, finished nursing school, went into um, to get a degree in Bible, and then went into the mission field and loved it. Yeah. So we spent uh, spent ten years working in missions. And where at exactly? Good question. So the first half, if you will, was predominantly the Philippines. Uh -huh. The second half was uh, Kenya, Africa. Yeah. Okay. So ten years doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that you eventually wanted to get back to the States because of, you know, various reasons, but one of them, you got really, really sick, right? Mm -hmm. um, ended up with a bacteria mm -hmm. and uh, really messed you up pretty good. Mm -hmm. Is that the sole reason for coming back or was there, you know, was there other reasons for, for yeah. getting out of the mission field? Yeah, good question. So um, out of all those years, I had gotten sick once early on in the Philippines, but it was easily recoverable. But then I got really sick um, around the 2018 time frame that, that sat me down for, for a while. But I was still going back. The main reason that I decided to come off the mission field was that I felt that just looking at my life, mm -hmm. considering my family, I was spending three to four months a year away from them on the mission field. And... I feel like I needed to be home more. And at the same time as I'm going through these thoughts, there was an opportunity that presented itself that God presented sure. at, to start a congregation in Indian land. So. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So uh, what I wanted to talk about today is kind of our, our approach to mission sometimes um, maybe can be a little skewed. Mm -hmm. I've recognized that. I know you have too, and we've talked about it, which is why I wanted to spark this conversation. Um, Talk about some of the experiences you had on the mission field with, um, you know, obviously reaching uh, the loss with the gospel and and but mainly the way you did church mm -hmm. and, and how you do church in the mission field versus, you know, maybe how it's done in our American culture in the Western world and the differences there and and maybe what you saw, what you noticed and, you know, and, and, and maybe maybe some of the challenges that you faced. I'd like to first start and end 
with this thought today. Okay. Mission work is wonderful. It's exciting and it's life changing. Yeah. Uh, it's good. And I believe it's God blessed. Uh, however, there are challenges that often people don't even realize if they're going to go on a short term trip and that's it. There's things that people may not recognize. So I think we're going to dive into some of that today. Uh, what I would like to say uh, first and foremost, we if, if you're going on a, on a mission trip, mm -hmm. um, think about cultural competency. Understand the culture the best that you can before you go. Good point. It wasn't until the 1960s that Kenya uh, was given independence from England. Mm -hmm. They were colonized for all that. People don't realize how long they were colonized uh, and, and even controlled. And, and what influence did that have on that culture? What language do they speak? Mm -hmm. There is a heart language. And if we don't know the language, if we can't even simply greet in the language of the people, it does create barriers. On the flip side, when you know language, people smile, they open up, they open their homes. And so oftentimes, and this is not at fault of groups that go, but oftentimes Americans, when they go to a foreign country, they get a very American experience in a foreign country. Right. And by that, I mean, we all fly on the same plane together. That's what a group does. Then we all get on a bus together, which is what a group does. Then we stay in a hotel in that foreign mission field, which is what a group does. Right. All of those are isolating from the culture. So it's like we're in this bubble to a degree. And then we go and we do the work that we have come to do. And then we come back. And so we just get a taste of it. And some of that can help with the transition of culture, but some of it can also prevent us from experiencing the depths of what's there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and I know that your philosophy towards missions was, um, we're not coming over here to give you money yeah. and to build you buildings yeah. and things like that, which is a rather American approach at times. And I don't yeah. mean to diminish that completely because right. I think that sometimes that's necessary, but you know, the story is told not by you, but by one of our elders that you were in, I believe it was the Philippines. And somebody said, one of the people there said, um, we, we need we need uh, money to, to build this building. And you said, well, I mean, you better raise it then because I'm not here to give you money. I'm here to teach the gospel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I just I, I like that approach. Uh, like I said, don't mean to diminish anyone who is sending money because that is necessary to function. Right. We need it for here. We need it for there as well. But it's not the number one reason that you're there. And I think sometimes we take an Americanized approach to the mission field. And uh, we think, well, we'll we'll throw money at it mm -hmm. or uh, we'll give money and uh, that'll solve all the issues yeah. or we'll go and build buildings and that'll solve all the issues. But there, there's way more to it than that, right? This, those are all great points. And this is very touchy yeah. because there are men and women who have given their lives and there are different mission philosophies or methodologies. Mm -hmm. I started very much in let's bring the money. Let's Americanize, let's call the shots. And that is a paternal mission methodology where you're this parent figure. Americans come, we've got the money, then we think we know best. And then we call the shots and we start down that approach. I started that way until a man named Edwin Cruikshank that I met at Polishing the Pulpit, who has spent more time in Africa than he has in America, married in Africa. Um, he so graciously corrected me and I so much appreciate it. He changed my view. Yeah. Why would this young guy go and try to figure everything else out on the mission field as if for the first time when I could go to him who's had 30, 40 years already there and ask him, where do I need to pick up from right. where you left off? Right. That is when the indigenous method was presented to me which is what I incorporated. That is very much a, I am coming to work shoulder to shoulder with people who are there, mm -hmm. Kenyans, Filipinos, Haitians. I've been to Haiti multiple times. I'm, I'm coming to work shoulder to shoulder to teach the gospel. Uh, that's very different than I'm coming to support you. I'm coming to build a church for you. I'm coming to 
send your kids to school or to start a feeding program. Not downing those things, but sometimes we need to step back and say, what have we come to do? Yeah. Um, Jesus had a very specific mission. He said very early on in the Gospel of Mark um, that, in fact, I'd like to read it. Yeah. In Mark chapter 1, verse 38, he said to them, Let us go into the towns, into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And to me, there's a lot here. Oftentimes, the American approach has been, let's go to a field, Let's find a piece of property. Let's figure out how to buy it. Let's build a church on it, a building on it, a school, an orphanage, and it becomes a compound. Yeah. And after a few years, what you have is a, a hundred thousand dollar or thereabout budget in a third world country, and you wonder how you got there. Yeah. And but what we see Jesus doing is mobilizing. It's in, in almost every mission work, you can see a pattern. If a land is bought, if a compound is formed, they saturate the area and there's a lot of success in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But then they plateau and sometimes end up dwindling. Yeah. But Jesus didn't stay in one spot. He moved. Yeah, good point. He moved from city to city, from town to town. And his overhead expenses were very minimal. Mm -hmm. And that is what I be, that is what I spent my time uh, in the last few years in Kenya doing. Yeah. Uh, I've worked with three different preaching schools, one in the Philippines, one in Haiti, and I started one in Kenya. It was a low budget preaching school, um, but th that ended up being dissolved all because of there was this expectation that when Americans come, they're supposed to give money. And when Americans come and give money, what ends up happening, if we're not careful, is we take away the dignity of the local people. And when you take away dignity, you take away responsibility. Mm -hmm. So when the school, when the walls start crumbling down, when the paint starts coming off, when the electricity breaks or the water, part, water pipes burst, they're not going to fix it right. because they never paid for it. Right. And There's they, no ownership. And they can't pay for it. Right. Because it's really expensive, yeah, and and so that's that ends up what's happening. And all the meanwhile, all these all this money is being spent. When what about the gospel? Yeah, yeah. If I hear you correctly, and, and this is uh, I, I have a limited uh, mission experience, although I, I've been three times to Mexico City, been to El Salvador. Um, but it sounds like you're saying that. Some of those things, maybe all those things are important. They're just peripheral mm -hmm. and we can't get sidetracked on those things right. and, and forget our number one purpose, which is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, make and grow disciples. Right. Yeah. And I, I think so many times we get sidetracked on those things. We try to grow too big. I talked to one missionary one time who admitted his failure in going to Africa and Ghana and saying, you know, we just tried to expand and build all these old churches in these little villages. And we were baptizing all these people. But when you went back a year later, they weren't faithful. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we get into that mindset too. You know, in the church, we like to count. You know, we're, we're mm -hmm. counters. We're, we like to quantify everything with numbers. How many people do we have Sunday morning or Sunday night or whatever? And, and we do that with baptisms. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we want to, you know, we put them in our bulletin. You know, how, how many baptisms do we have this week or this month or whatever? Mm -hmm. And we do that in the mission field. You know, how many baptisms did we have over the last year? You know, the better question is, how many disciples did you make? Oh. And, and that takes a lot longer to figure out, perhaps, mm -hmm. and a lot longer uh, or more effort, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we feel like if we dunked them and delivered them, we're good, and mm -hmm. we can put that number up, that tally up. And I, I think there's there's a way bigger picture at play here, which is, like you said, making and growing disciples, giving them ownership. So your indigenous approach, which I always felt like was the best approach as well, is to preach the gospel, develop leadership, turn it over to the people yes. so that it becomes theirs and they yes. have the ownership, right? That's correct. So uh, <clears throat> I actually did a little bit of my own research on this. Mm -hmm. And it's, this has been proven. Um, this, so in the, in the 70s, a group of missionaries went to Kenya. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to sort of 
I'm not going to go real long into the story. I'm going to crunch it right down to the details. They went to different tribes because mm-hmm. Kenya is divided up into tribes. Well, Fielden and Jeanette Allison went to the Kalenjin tribe. Okay. Other missionaries went to different tribes. They learned the tribal tongue, not the national language, but okay. they learned the Kipsigi language. They did not build buildings. They met in homes. Yeah. They let the cream rise to the top. In other words, they did not let them look at them as the leaders. They said, You're, you have to be leaders of your own church. What came out of that were, were church plants in the Kalenjin tribe, which were about three times the amount uh, of the church plants in the Kissy tribe. I spent time a lot of time with the Kissy tribe. Their missionary came and was the patriarchal, build buildings, support, support the preachers. They had about 30 churches there where the churches in the Kalenjin land was three to 10 times more amount of churches, anywhere from 100 to 300 churches, all Mm self-supported, self-started compared to supported by Americans. And so in the long term, what you see is you just, you let the culture do what the culture can do. Yeah. And I always lived by the rule of, I believed people on the mission field grew and worked better in my absence than in my presence. Yeah. So when I came home and I was working with churches at home in between my mission journeys, I believe there was incredible growth without me being a distraction there. Yeah, that's, that's, I I don't hear that very often. That's amazing. Um, And talk a little bit about, I've experienced this a little, I know you've experienced it a lot where people come from the States, maybe just to visit the mission work with you and to work alongside you for a week period or Mm -hmm. whatever, or maybe it is a missionary that's coming over to spend a substantial amount of time and how, you know, I, I think that we believe, I'll say this, I think that sometimes we believe, some people believe that if you were to go back to the first century and walk uh, into a building uh, where they were having a church service, that it would look just like it does today. You know, you'd come in, you'd sit down, you look at the back of somebody's head and, you know, you have a song leader leading four part harmony and you have, you know, a preacher that gets up and, you know, it all looks like this, like a, like an Americanized situation when that nothing could be further from the truth, right? Mm-hmm. It's not that we're not striving to do the things that they did and be what they were. But I think sometimes that happens. I think a lot of times that happens in the mission field that we go over to Kenya or Mexico City or wherever it is. And we try to Americanize the people mm-hmm. and make the church look exactly like it does here when um, that shouldn't be the goal. I'll give you an example. I was at a church in Mexico City and um, you know, church services were like three or four hours. Uh, because Mexico City's 30 million people. They mm-hmm. didn't come back for a Sunday night service. It's too hard to get there in the first place. Yeah. So they'd come in about nine or 10 o'clock. They'd stay to one or two. And during the singing, people would get up. They might go get a cup of coffee or some breakfast. You know, they're going to be there a while. Um, there, there may be, um, you know, uh, an, an order that's different than ours and yep. things like that. But uh, at the end of the day, there was, um, there was a, a song happening and, and, and they were clapping in the middle of the song. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the folks from uh, America came over and said, no, 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 you, you don't do that here. You know, you don't do that. And, and you know, they, they looked at him like he, you know, had a, a second head because it's like, what, what, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're not here with us every week. You're coming over trying to tell us how to do this. And that's just a, a, a small example. But I, I think so many times we feel like if it doesn't function exactly the way we do it, then it's wrong and we've got to set them straight. But you operate within the culture you're in, right? Great point. So this might step on some toes or ruffle some feathers with what I'm about to say. I've been to nine different countries. The only churches in those foreign countries that have a Sunday night worship and a Wednesday night worship, the only ones who do that are highly Americanized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The indigenous churches, especially in Kenya, they worship in the morning for three or four hours. Many of them walked three to six miles to get there. Yeah. They walked three to six miles to get back. The church buildings don't have electricity. They're not going to be there Sunday night or Wednesday night. Right. They've never done that unless there's a gospel meeting where they meet every night in the 
in the evening, but before it gets dark. Right. And so <clears throat> those are things we're used to. And there's benefit to meeting more often. However, if we come with the idea that, well, if you don't do it like we're doing it, then you're wrong. We have, we have not expressed our love and understanding of Christians in another culture. Yeah, we're bringing our traditional baggage to them and That's saying, right. you know, and not recognizing that it is traditional baggage. But, yeah. you know, um, I, I think that's one of the things that I noticed in going to other cultures and other places. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there was absolutely no compromise <clears throat> on biblical truth. Sure. You know, I mean, that there is no compromise there, you know, right? I mean, if you're preaching the gospel and you're, you're teaching all that I commanded you and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the ages, Jesus said, if you're doing that second part of the Great Commission, you know, there, there's going to be a structure, there's going to be an organization that's going to look like the first church in a lot of ways, especially in the acts of worship as we call them. But the traditional part is what seemed to irk some people that I was with. Mm -hmm. And you had to remind them that, look, that, that's, that's the traditional part in America. It's not something that's transferred over here. And so let's be careful about elevating tradition, our tradition especially, to the level of doctrine or the way we think they should operate. You know, what, How would we feel if visitors from a foreign country came to our worship services mm -hmm. and told us that we needed to be doing things differently? Yeah. It's the same feeling that goes back the other way. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Talk about some of the biggest challenges you faced in the mission field. What were some of the biggest challenges and maybe how they relate to here? I mean, sure. Uh, I'll start with spiritually speaking. It's what you've already spoken about. Discipleship. Mm -hmm. To baptize 50 people in a two week period sounds great. Yeah. But I, I really, really wonder what happens to those precious souls? Uh, do they have people who come and follow up and minister and study and encourage? And so <clears throat> that same thing happens here yeah. in the United States. What do we do when we follow up with people after they're baptized? Do we have something in place where people are paying attention to souls who have said, I want to follow Jesus who are baptized and then are kind of sitting going, well, now what? Yeah. So that that would be a challenge that that needs to be thought about and needs to be addressed. And sometimes we just need to slow down. Uh, we need to we need to slow down. We need to we need to build relationships. We need to study. And we when they're baptized, we need to spend some time with these people. And I know mission trips it feels like a rush because it is. it is. You get through jet lag and all this travel and you're trying to experience as much as possible in a two week time frame so you can get back. But sometimes we need to slow down. And so from a spiritual perspective, I would say that would be one of my biggest concerns is that discipleship from a material perspective, money. Mm -hmm. We will all be challenged on a mission trip. Our hearts will be tugged and torn when we see little kids run around that have no shoes. And moms who come up that have several children saying, would you please send my kids to school? Yeah. Or a father who pulls you aside and says, I've got a, I've got a hole in my ceiling. Can you pay for a new roof? Mm -hmm. Or someone who says, I have a job, but I don't have transportation. Can you buy me a motorcycle? Uh, that those are sometimes we don't know what to do. And sometimes because we feel so bad, we're inclined to say, I'll pray about it. That means yes. In almost every country that I've been in, mm. I'll pray about that. I'll pray for you. Fantastic. You've just given this person or this family hope that you're going to pay for something now. When instead, we need to be prepared even before we go to the mission field. What is our purpose? I've gone on medical missions where my sole purpose uh, was to treat people because I'm a registered nurse. So it was to treat people medically. That was my sole purpose. Yeah. I've gone on gospel missions where my sole purpose had nothing to do with medical. Yeah. And when people come to me and say, can you send my husband to the hospital? It's not why I came. Right. I came to preach the gospel. And so Jesus said in Matthew 5, 37, 
let your yes be yes, yes and your no be no. Don't give people false hope. It hurts. It's, it's so much burden. But certainly don't say, well, okay, I'll pray for you. Uh, you're giving people false hope. Um, it, it, you need to say, I'm not going to be able to do that. Yeah. I came to do this. And that helps people there in, in, in that country understand, well, why, why did you come then? Oh, okay, we came for this. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah, and I think Jesus was all about that. You know, if you're striving to do it the way he did it, you know, be what he was, then, um, you know, he helped some mm -hmm. and, and physically to reach them spiritually. And <clears throat> we're not saying that that's, uh, that, we, that we shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is, you know, we, we can't do that every time. And Jesus didn't do that every time. Yeah. He didn't heal everybody. He didn't, yeah. you know, uh, and, and it's just not possible. I, I know exactly what you're saying because, you know, being in El Salvador, you know, you, you see these kids playing soccer with a deflated ball, uh, yeah. you know, and you're like, I mean, a soccer ball is nothing. I mean, it costs nothing. You know, I, I, I can buy my soccer ball and, and I did, you know, um, but there's always a limit to what you can do mm -hmm. and, and how much you can do. Right. And, and those things can get you off of your main focus right. and, and distract you from, from what it is that you're there to do. I sat across and studied with a woman who had five children, whose mm -hmm. husband just died of a kidney infection. Mm -hmm. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't afford penicillin, which is something that's just readily available. It could have been cured with that readily available here. It just breaks your heart. Now she's raising five kids without any sort of, uh, you know, guidance and, and, uh, and help from her husband. And those kind of things just tear you apart. That's right. Um, but man, you're giving them something so much more valuable, right? Mm -hmm. You know, not saying that you can't help them physically and sure. nor that you should, uh, but you know, ultimately what you're giving them is so much more. I, I don't know how you feel about this, but so often I would go to these places and think, you know, um, I hope I can teach something. God helped me to teach them. And you always came back feeling like you learned more than you, than, than you, than you helped. Right. I felt like I gained way more than, than I ever did as far as giving them. Is that how you felt as well? That is an awesome point. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. We need to honestly probably do a better job of understanding and communicating here before we go. One of the reasons we're going on a mission field is for ourselves. Yeah. And in fact, it's a large reason. We think, hey, we're going to go because we're going for God. We're going to go because we're going to help some, some, some people in a distant land. But really, when we go, we grow tremendously. Yeah. Now that may not be the reason why we go, but it ends up being one of the reasons that we went or that we're so glad we went because now we have a worldview that we didn't have before. Sure. We can see things a little bit better than we were able to see before. Sure. And so we grow spiritually and then there's there's relationships that develop. I mean, there's some people that were able to make a trip or maybe two trips with me in times past and they have been able to maintain a communication with someone that they met on the mission field through Facebook or WhatsApp. Or, and, and that is so encouraging to say, you know what? I've got a Christian sister or a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ that's, you know, on the other side of the world. Yeah. And we still encourage each other to this day. And that happens and it's beautiful and it's awesome. And so, but I do believe that when we go on missionary journeys, we, we come back enriched incredibly I do. from the experience. I do. And, and I do want to say this. This is probably a whole nother episode or podcast, but I, I do want to say that, you know, a lot of what we're talking about applies to our own backyard. Yes. You know, the mission field is right outside the walls of this studio, right outside the walls of this church building. And there are people in on our street, mm -hmm. across the street, perhaps from us that need the gospel every bit as much as somebody in Kenya or anywhere else. And same things that we talked about apply. I mean, we can help them physically, mm -hmm. but that's not the only reason we help them. We're trying to reach them spiritually. Even the traditional baggage argument that we talked about a while ago. I mean, uh, I know that sometimes churches will shoot themselves in the foot because, you know, an individual who's, you know, maybe they've been working with comes to church where you don't have a tie on or you're not dressed in, uh, you know, yeah. nice enough, yeah. stuff like that, you know. And so, uh, you know, same application, 
if we're trying to reach people, we're still trying to preach the gospel. We're still trying to reach them with the life saving message. Mm -hmm. And that applies uh, here in our culture or any culture. Right. Yeah, yeah you, you got it. You got it. And again, it comes back down to cultural competency. Mm -hmm. What's going on in culture? Yeah. Um, now, the gospel supersedes culture. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but. I think we would do well to study the passages that, you know, there's hills that people die on mm -hmm. and, uh, and and they want to fight for. But we do, we would do well to, to study those carefully, yeah. especially when we're in a different culture and people have thought differently their entire life. Yeah. And they see some things a little bit different than others. And, and, and this is just a, a very innocent example. But in Kenya, women sit on one side of the church building. Mm hmm. And men sit on the other. Yeah. They do. Men do not sit by their wives. Yeah. And uh, you know, we, we might walk in there and go, "What's the segregation problem here?" Yeah. Well, yeah. there's not a problem. This is a cultural thing. No, I've heard the same example with. Uh, uh, I don't remember where the church was, but in their culture, um, women were they served always. Mm -hmm. They served the men, and you know, in our culture, you know. Um, you know, we may look at that as misogynistic or chauvinistic or whatever, but, sure. you know, that was just how the culture operated. And thus, the women served on the Lord's table, you know, mm -hmm. the Lord's Supper. Uh, you know, you talk about women passing trays, and we've argued that. Can they do it? Can they not? Well, you know, biblically, there's no precedent because they were around a table. You know, that just wasn't a uh, discussion they were having. Yeah. But, um, you know, the women served, mm -hmm. and they served the Lord's Supper because it was a they were in a servant culture, and the women served. And you know, American folks went over there and they're like, you know, this is crazy. She's in a leadership position. I'm like, oh, yeah. No, no, no. Pump the brakes a little bit. It's sure. different culture. Operate within their culture and see it the way that they, you know, try, try to see it the way they see it. Right. And uh, that that's another example of that is that just understanding well, cultural competency. I love yeah. that. Love that yeah. phrase. That's good. Yeah. Chad, thanks for joining us, man. Yes, sir. This was a great discussion. Uh, you're going to see more of Chad because uh, being one of my coworkers now, I plan to use him a lot and uh, just appreciate you being on today. I want to tell our listeners and viewers that if you have a question about today's episode, you can email me at chris.mccurley at rippleoflight.com. If you have a question specifically for Chad, we'll make sure that he gets it, and I'm sure you'd be glad to, to answer that. We just thank you for tuning in. Chad, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Sincerely, Chris.